Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Chloe Chapman. I am manager of special projects with Build It Green. Uh, Build It Green, we're a nonprofit based in Oakland, California that connects change makers to transform the housing system in service of human and ecological vitality. Uh, our roots are in bringing residential green building into the mainstream with credible and accessible resources and Oh, oh and uh, sorry, if we could mute ourselves. Thank you. Um, so our roots are, are in bringing residential green building into the mainstream with credible, accessible resources and innovations, including the Green Point rated home certification uh, program. And uh, today we're excited to be hosting the practical guide to all electric, lower cost multifamily buildings with EV charging. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in chat. Um, they'll be primarily answered well, they'll be answered by both Nick and Robert uh, throughout the presentation. Um, and if you have any tech issues, feel free to also let us know in chat, uh, message the panelists, uh, Nick Brown, Robert For Fortunato, or myself, and we'll try to help you. But you can also email me at cchapman at builditgreen.org. Um, we are recording the session. It will be available after the presentation. Um, and uh, we'd like to introduce our instructors today. Today we have with us Nick Brown from BuildSmart. Uh, Nick is president of BuildSmart. It's an energy consultancy specializing in California energy modeling, building performance, and energy training. Uh, his company supports architects in designing energy efficient buildings with code compliance documents, um, optimizing high performance buildings, and designing and teaching energy related classes such as this one across California. Uh, we also have Robert Fortunato. He's president of Four Strategy Consulting. Uh, he's also the owner and builder of the Green Idea House, which is one of the first affordable net zero energy, zero carbon case study houses built with standard construction materials and off-the-shelf technologies. Uh, he also is the proud winner of the 2012 Builder of the Year Award um, from Build It Green. Uh, so they both live in their own net zero homes. They general contracted uh, the work themselves, so they're they're uh, perfect for teaching this uh, this this class here. So thank you both, Nick and Robert. I'll let you both take it from here. Thank you, Chloe. Thanks so much, Chloe. Yeah. Hi, Robert. How are you today? I'm great, Nick. Looking Good. forward to uh, to this, and I love the fact that people are lighting up the chat already. Yeah, uh, me with, too. With where they're from and what they're interested in, and it, we love to customize these these programs for everybody's benefit, including yeah. ours. We, we wanna be engaged with everybody and, and answer questions as we go. Absolutely. And what we really hope you come out of this with, it looks like many of you are already working actively in the multifamily space, is an understanding of how to do these buildings all electric, why including the EV charging amenity is a, a smart move these days, and how multifamily buildings can be done durably, safely, future-proof with all the right economics, you know, that developers look for and with a compelling value proposition to renters or occupants. So let me start with a little about me and then hand it off to Robert. Uh, here's my house in Long Beach where I'm coming to you from today. Uh, remodeled it in a deep energy retrofit in 2016. Typical size. We did it with a uh, very mainstream budget as well. And it's not a science fair inside. It's a wonderful place to live. It's uh, beautiful. I like to say you can't be sustainable without being beautiful because then no one's going to want to take care of it. Uh, and that's certainly what we tried to live by here. And our house is green point rated. And I'm a KBEC CEA, uh, so I do energy modeling for a living. There is our green point rated certificate that I added just for this session. I think that's a pretty good score. Um, and here's what it looks like today with an all electric ADU rising above the garage. So we are continuing to live it. Now, when I did my remodel, Robert had done his a few years earlier and certainly served as a inspiration for our project. He chose to do his all electric and all my energy modeling software was telling me that gas was a, a good option too. 
And so I included gas in our design, a, a high efficiency gas tankless water heater and gas furnace. We did go electric cooking with an induction cooktop. And we did have a gas dryer that has since been changed to an electric heat pump dryer when the gas one went on the fritz. I would tell you today, I would make a completely different decision and do it all electric, knowing what I know now, and especially as the technologies has, have evolved. And so Robert's probably going to give me a good natured ribbing for that decision throughout our <laughs> presentation today. Is that right? That's what we always do, Nick. That's the, that's the nature of our relationship. I told you so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I teach a bunch of classes, including Robert and I teach one for single family, all electric homes. I also teach the Energy Code Ace class for residential architects. And I can tell you, it was wonderful for my business and for my family as I put two kids through college to have five years of no electric bill uh, accomplished with just 16 solar panels by designing it to be energy efficient from the start. Rates are evolving, starting to see a change in my bill as I've come off the old grandfathered uh, rate and into the more current uh, rate in SCE territory, but still uh, really glad with the decisions we made. So Robert, why don't you take it from there and introduce yourself? Yes, I'm happy to. Nick, thank you. Let me open the slide. Is that it? Nope. It was. There, there you go. There we go. OK. So can you see it now? Yeah. All right, fantastic. Again, my name is Robert Fortson. I'm president of Force Strategy Consulting and the owner and builder of the Green Idea House. Uh, we came out of the ground in 2012 <clears throat> and we wanted to create one of the first net zero energy, zero carbon case study houses, primarily for health reasons and cost reasons. So uh, my wife and I had traveled the world and had seen different models for how things are built uh, with less waste and less energy. And, and, and we wanted to do this thing and uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, to say the least, and and um, but we did we managed to do it, and uh, just like Nick, we didn't want to create a spaceship and we didn't want to create a mud hut. Uh, we had seen those models, and nobody wants to live in a spaceship, and nobody wants to live in a mud hut. <laughs> so just really simply, <clears throat> and we wanted to make it affordable. So we came out of the ground for two hundred bucks a square foot. Nick came out of the ground for one sixty four. So we know this is possible to do, and. Um, and so we haven't had an energy bill for the last 10 years. It's been 10 years that we've been living in this house. And we not only operate the house, but we actually operate two electric cars as well. And still, it's still net zero energy. Um, and thanks to the Build a Green organization who Greenpoint rated uh, the building because the direction um, that they set for what we should be doing was absolutely on mark. And I re really appreciated the fact that they they had the right um, rate uh, thought process as well as the right price point for getting buildings rate, rated uh, and a, a sensibility that it's not only about the checklist, but it's about how will this building actually perform over time. And I really appreciate that, that about the uh, Build a Green organization. Uh, our house is 2,100 square feet. It was 1,300 square feet. We added a uh, you know, second story on the front end of the house. We have a 6.5 kilowatt PV array, 26 panels. And, um, and it's worked flawle almost flawlessly. Um, you know, a lot of people say, say, say to me, what, you know, what would you have done differently? Not much, uh, quite frankly. It has worked very, very well. If you want to hear the backstory on how it works and, and you know, some of the other details, we have done a TED Talk. Uh, so if you type in my name and you put TEDx in there, you'll, you'll see it. In 18 minutes, you get the full backstory, which I don't, we don't have the time for today. Uh, but we have had over 5,000 people through the property before, during, and after construction. It's really a public case study. We should, it's an open source project. We want to share what we learned. And uh, that's really our, our deepest intention. Uh, as you can see from the, um, the Edison, our Edison bill on the lower right-hand side, um, that tells you basically every one of those bars is a month, a month in the year. And every bar that's above the line means that we're using more energy than we harvest. And every month that's below the line is we're harvesting more energy than we use. Uh, and so you can see on an annualized basis that we are actually net zero energy because there's no other inputs. There's no gas in, in the building. Um, and so that shows 100% of our energy load. What we want you guys to do with us today is take a little journey, 
right? Uh, and so this is our agenda for the day. We want to understand your needs for the class. So if you want to understand something very specific or even more general, type it into the chat. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to tailor this as much as we can. We have a very restricted time period today. Um, and we can only do so much in the hour and a half that we have together, but we're going to do a lot. Um, and if you're interested in more, we have another four hour class, uh, which happens on April 26th. Is that correct, Nick? Um, and that will give you a lot more. We have time to do a lot more detail, answer a lot more questions in that format. And you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, sign up for so, sign up for it on the uh, Southern California Edison um, site. So today we're going to go through our seven steps for building all electric more cost effective, uh, more cost effectively. I think you have an interesting and different uh, profile for presenters in this, in that we've actually general contracted, you know, we put our boots on and we actually general contracted these things. We designed general contracted and live in these buildings. So we not only you know, talk about these things, but we live it every day. We maintain these buildings. We understand the nuts and bolts of what it takes to get there and what it takes to stay there. Um, and so if you have any specific questions, we're really well uh, versed in, in how to help that. Uh, we're going to talk about how electrification saves time, money, energy, aggravation uh, for developers, specifically multifamily developers, and also improves your NOI and resale value, which is critical. Um, we're going to talk about the EV charging opportunity. You have an opportunity to basically put a gas station in the, you know, in the base of your building that can be a revenue source. And uh, especially with, with uh, the incentives that are available to you right now, it's a, it's a very compelling uh, way to improve your NOI. Uh, and so we, we have resources for you. We have all kinds of things, but if, please type, type into the chat what you would like to get out of this, because again, we would like to tailor it to your needs. Um, Nick is going to go through a little word from our sponsor. Yeah, um, SCE, as you probably know, we've got a lot of Southern California folks here today. Thank you, Chloe, for delivering them as promised. Um, is a progressive electric utility. They don't have gas in their portfolio. And so they really are pushing the ball forward in support of the state's clean energy transition and the goals that our legislature set. Their Pathway 40, 2045 document lays out a lot of what they're doing. Um, but this class is a good example of it. And we were at the KBEC conference, the Energy Consultants Conference just last week. And the buzz around electrification is getting louder and louder where just a few years ago it was it was quiet it was a, a sidebar um, and now there's incentive money to go with it including the tech program the build program the energy smart homes program and you'll get those links uh, as chloe sends you the pdf afterwards so you can get into that because now there's there's money to go with uh, what the state's been asking us to do electrify buildings thanks yeah, Robert. thanks Nick. yeah perfect all right so our seven steps are, are simple at their core but there's some details that if you miss them uh, you know there are missteps and we've seen projects not go well quite frankly, uh, if you miss some of these steps. And so we're gonna talk through, you know, what's the advantage of having one less utility? And, and I think most developers understand this intuitively, but we're gonna go through it um, specifically. We're, uh, we're gonna have you help you embrace the better technologies that are available. I, yesterday, need to go and buy an anode rod for, for our, every five years, you should change the anode rods in your hot water tanks. So I went to this plumbing supply store and um, the guy said, so what do you need? And I said, for my heat pump hot water, uh, you know, I need a anode rod. And he said, what? A what? And, and I said, a heat pump hot water heater. And, and he said, I've never heard of that. And he said, I've been in the business for 35 years. I've never heard of that. And this is a well-established plumbing supply place, right? And, I'm, and, and so I took no kidding, 45 minutes, we looked them up on the internet and I showed him and I told, he says, holy cow, I have an old gas fired tank. I'm going to replace it with this thing. This thing's amazing. Like he was so impressed, but the fact that he'd never heard of it and he's worked in plumbing supplies for 35 years is mind blowing to me. Um, so there's a lot of great technologies that people just don't know about. And he said, well, you know what? I thought tankless was the next best thing. 
I'm like, no, that's already gone by. <laughs> yeah. you no, know, that was that was the best next thing ten years ago, right? So there's a lot of technology. We're talking through the technology very quickly today. Um, we know these buildings are more marketable. Um, all of the new ten, the millennials want better, healthier buildings, and that's what you can deliver more easily with with e electric um, buildings and EVs in them. We can leverage that, I mentioned the EVs, the, the garage with EV charging and other amenities. We can start early. This is the one thing that we keep having to harp on because people want to plan the way they, they've always planned. And this requires a little bit of, it's not difficult, it just requires some different planning up front. Um, and then we know that using you know, more efficient electrical systems is easier for code compliance. And luckily we have one of the best modelers in the state on with us. Nick does this every single day, helps developers do this more easily as a result of his expertise in this very specific area. And, um, and lastly, we're gonna help you avoid some common missteps. Uh, I, I have for the last seven years been auditing multifamily buildings, primarily affordable housing developments, and the stuff that I see, even on lead platinum buildings, will make your hair curl. It's unbelievable how bad some of these things are that waste hundreds of, if not millions of dollars over the life of these buildings and can be easily avoided if we just have a consciousness about it. Uh, and then I take what I learned from these audits and I help these developers basically plow these learnings into the pipeline of new developments coming down the pike for them and saving them millions of dollars at the same time. So that's what I've been doing for the last seven years, um, you know, and as well as teaching with Nick and doing a variety of other things. So, uh, so here we go. First step, one less utility. This is simple for you guys. If you don't have to have one more utility on your site, guess what? Your project's going to be easier, cheaper, and less it's going to be more aggravation free, right? We know there's delays and all kinds of stuff. And all with all deference to our sponsor, no one wants to wait for the utility hookups. We know that they're always late. And, and so we just don't want to do it, let alone the capital costs. I mean, I, again, this is from my auditing of multifamily you know, and you know what's happening here, right? Every one of these build, every one of these units has a gas stove, right? And other gas appliances in their units, and the level of infrastructure that's necessary is ridiculous. Uh, and the fact that we're in a, an earthquake zone. Guess what? We're in an earthquake zone. What happens to this in an earthquake? We know what happens to this in an earthquake. It's not good. So eliminate it. So that's what we're going to teach you how to do today. So Nick had an example um, and he was working with a client doing modeling work and the, the client said back to him really what the deal was. And so we wanted to articulate that. Nick, you want to you tell him what he said? Yeah, we chose this example because sometimes people think all electric is just for tree huggers. And this example shows not true. Uh, this client is not a tree hugger at all. He's a pro forma bottom line driven developer like many of my clients. And he said, I want you to help me design this building all electric. And I said, sure, what's driving this? He said, just doesn't make sense. He, he was probably looking at a picture similar to what Robert just had up on the screen. And he said, why would I run all those gas lines through my building? It's expensive, it's, it takes space, just from a financial perspective. And we were able to do that. This was a four story, four habitable story um, project. So it had to meet the non-residential Title 24 energy code, the 2019 current code. We were able to do it just fine. And that was despite the fact that the MEP engineer who had old information was advising him against going all electric saying you'll never meet Title 24. And Robert, there were a few comments, at least one in the chat that people were having trouble meeting Title 24 with all electric designs. So really good they tuned in today because it has not been my experience. In the current code cycle, we have what's called the electric modeling pathway that has facilitated all electric projects real well for me, especially, yeah. boy, now we've got a high performance heat pump credit that can, can get us ahead of the gas by a large margin. Yes, and, and they're right, Nick, it used to be the case that all electric was more difficult. So they're not wrong. That's it's right. just they might not be familiar with the latest generation of the code, right? Uh, because they actually disadvantaged all electric in the previous code cycle, and they've rectified that significantly in the, the current cycle. So, um, so you guys aren't wrong. 
uh, but there's new information. And, and we want to share that with you today. Again, Nick is one of the best modelers in the state, especially for this particular thing. And he's going to share that uh, in detail uh, in this program today. All right. So I'm not going to spend a lot more time, but we know, you know, there's a huge savings of time, money and aggravation. You don't have to tee into the gas line, you know, no trenching, no, the guys with the flags, all that stuff goes away because you know the only thing you can put in that trench is the gas line. You can't put your sewer in. You can't put anything else in that you can't put the electrical in there so why have a separate dedicated trench for this thing just let's do away with it and then roof penetrations let's talk roof for all the stuff on the roof can go away essentially ha at least half of it can go away so that you can actually put solar on the roof people are not thinking about roofs as the engine of the building and that's what i've been for the last 10 years talking to people about the roof should be the engine of the building we have to think about it this way you are disabling your engine by putting all this stuff on the roof you, where you it's just a disabling your ability to put good solar that's going to have a great NOI for you on your buildings. Uh, next, we know the price of solar and wind is the least expensive way that you can generate electricity. Uh, we know that. And the fact that is rooftop solar is the only means that you have uh, that that you have of it's a means of production that you can actually own or lease uh, to create energy and in, in a way which is um, financially beneficial and we know from the chart on the right that we expect electricity rates to rise much more slowly than gas rates and we're seeing that today in the gas spikes that are happening um, for you know less than obvious reasons uh, we won't go into all that stuff um, there, Nick and I are both trained as economists uh, not you know, greenies uh, to start out with. And we just saw these curves. And these two curves are the things that have changed everything to go allow people to go all electric. The first one on the left hand is the price of solar. And the, the one on the right hand side, the left hand side is price of solar. The right hand side is the price of batteries. These two things will continue to decrease. Right now, it's more expensive to install the solar uh, than the actual price of the hardware uh, we're finding. So things are changing significantly um, in the solar market. Um, so lastly, you should know that in California specifically, <clears throat> um, there is a mandate from AB100 that they, the grid will be 100% renewable by 2045. And that changes everything. That means that no matter what you plug into the grid, it is automatically more renewable. The grid is about 30% renewable now, and it will go to 100% by 2045. So everything that you plug into there will be more sustainable than trying to do it by gas or any other source. Uh, we know that it's less expensive. There's a great study, an E3 study, where there's a link to it at the back of uh, our presentation. And at, in uh, at almost every market, it is less expensive to build all electric. So we know your competitors are doing this. Um, we have surveyed the best developers in the country, and some of them are, are doing astounding things. This one's in Philadelphia. Uh, there are Onion Flats. I talked with Tim McDonald's, the, the, the developer there, and he's doing an amazing job. And I'm from Philadelphia, so this is not a diss on Philadelphia, but I never thought this would come out of Philadelphia. <laughs> so for 130 bucks a square foot and 249 uh he's created all electric net zero energy very highly efficient units that he can rent for less as a result of that he chooses to rent for less because he wants to basically fit with a certain profile uh to support a certain community in, in his neighborhood uh but the fact is that these these buildings are working amazingly amazingly well uh, we have some other examples. I'm not going to go through each one. We don't have time to go through each one. But there, so if somebody could mute, that would be appreciated. Um, and but we wanted to give you various examples of different ones that you can look through uh, to say this is all possible and it's actually happening already. The future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I think is the quote, right? So we're going to walk you through the technologies as quickly as possible because I think we're already behind on time, aren't we, Nick? Um, we are trying to help you understand how to replace each one of these technologies from induction cooking, heat pump wa water heaters, heat pump HVAC, laundry, fireplaces, pool heating. It's all possible to do. Um, and we're going to show you that really quickly. Number one, uh, just take a look at the second and third uh, cooking appliances on the Consumer Reports list, right? 
the induction one is half the cost of the gas one, right? And it actually works better. Um, Nick and I have been working, uh, cooking with induction cooktops uh, and there's nothing like it. If you haven't tried it, a lot of people say, well, you have to use special pots. And the fact is that, you know, here are the special pots. Uh, if somebody has to complain as a developer, buy your tenant new pots. Uh, it's $119 and it's not a big deal. It, they just have to have metal in them. Uh, that's the key. So you can use um, cast iron pots work, for example. A lot of people like cast iron. But this is all technology that's here today. It works better, less chance of um, fire, um, less chance of explosion, and it's better for your health. The formaldehyde, the sodium dioxide, and the nitrous oxide that come off your, your flame cook, cooking is not good for your health. So if for no other reason than that, uh, that's a great reason. The last reason is that 40% of the energy that goes into your pot is lost between the flame and the bottom of the pot, um, for a full 40%. So you're wasting a ton of energy at the same time you're poisoning yourself. So let's move on to better technology with cooking. Second is the heat pump hot water heater. This is an amazing appliance. We installed them 10 years ago and it's working like clockwork. Uh, you have to maintain, it's a little maintained. It's, it's an anode rod and a filter change and you clean out the bottom of the tank like you do any other tank, but they're less maintenance than what people have been installing, which are uh, tankless hot water heaters. And they're three times more efficient than a tankless hot water heater. And guess what? When the water gets cut out in an earthquake, you have 50 gallons of fresh drinking water right there. Um, so that's really compelling in an earthquake zone to have 50 gallons of fresh drinking water that is stored. And guess how much you have in, um, in a tankless hot water, right? That's a big goose egg. It's like an ounce of fresh water in there. So that's a huge uh, opportunity uh, to sell, right, going forward. There's also a timer in there that helps you do something really interesting because Time of use rates are a thing. And here you can see what is called the duck curve. And the duck curve basically says that the more solar that has come onto the, onto the grid during the middle of the day means that it's actually less expensive to, to do stuff in the middle of the day. So what could you do? You could charge your electric car during the middle of the day for less cost. You could also store hot water in the middle of the day. We have our hot water tanks set to 140 degrees. And in the middle of the day, they fully charge up. And so that at the end of the day, we turn them off and then they don't use energy at the most expensive time of the day. So this is a huge opportunity. Um, next, we wanna talk about multifamily buildings. There's basically three ways to deploy hot water in a building. One is centralized where you have a recirculation loop connected to a centralized resource. And that's most, that has been traditionally the most common. Uh, then there's a shared resource where uh, basically you have a chase which runs uh, up and down the building with a couple of tanks. And we've seen that deployed successfully. And in fact, Onion Flats uses that method. And the third method, which is becoming more popular, depending on the type and the size of the building, is to have one unit that, especially in like two or three bedroom units, one dedicated unit per, uh, uh, one dedicated um, hot water tank per unit. And, and I'll walk you through very quickly the advantages and disadvantages of each. The pros uh, of the centralized unit, it doesn't take a lot of rentable square footage, right? So if the rentable footage is someplace else, generally on the roof. But as we talked about before, the roof is the engine of the building. So you're disabling the, the roof in order to generate electricity by putting stuff on it. So this is a, kind of an old model. Um, but it is, is still viable to do if you wanted to do it with heat pump hot water heaters because there's something called a water drop palletized unit, which allows you to, with a crane, just easily crane up those units and do it as sort of a system. And so that's all possible to do. Uh, the disadvantage, obviously, you have to have a crane anytime that you need major servicing or replacement. Uh, whereas these other units uh, that you'll see here is you don't need, you know, you can bring them on the elevators and you don't need to have specialized equipment to repair and replace them. Um, this generally has a warranty of about 18 months. Um, this shared unit has a warranty of three years. 
And the shared unit is basically putting these things in tandem to go up that chase that we talked about before. Uh, you have to find the space in the building. So generally in the bottom of the building, in the garage or something like that, you have to allocate the space for them. Um, but it doesn't take up rentable space. Again, these first two choices don't take up rentable space, which every developer is concerned about. But the question is, are you are you holding the building or are you just, you know, are you just building the building to flip or are you holding the building becomes the question. If you're holding the building, you really want to think about these last two alternatives uh, because they will save you millions of dollars over time. This third option has a 10 year warranty. And that means anything happens to that unit within 10 years, you just rip it out and you put another one in under warranty. And that's a huge advantage for any developer. And the fact is the whole building doesn't go down when one of these units go down. If one of these other units go down, you might have a separate unit working in tandem, but if both of those go, goes down, you know what happens. The building is really, your tenants are not happy at all. Hot water is really critical. In this scenario, you, you only have one tenant who, who's unhappy for a very short amount of time because you can replace it that quickly. So there's a lot of advantages to thinking about this. You do have to be mindful though, this, is, this doesn't work like a regular, hot water heater, um, there are some interesting components of it. It needs to have a louvered door, for example, uh, so that it can take in the air that it needs to push push into the water to make the, the hot water. Um, and it also has, a, it, it makes a little noise. It sounds like a, um, a, a very, very quiet dishwasher. Um, so it's about 40 decibels, basically. So you don't want to put it next to a bedroom and have it clicking on and off. Uh, for example, that's another um, placement is, is hugely important there. All right, so we're going to move on to HVAC systems. HVAC systems, um, generally the number one or number two user of energy. And there's a lot of new technology on the marketplace that helps us get to um, an all electric profile. Uh, there's an Innova um, product here that you see, which is now called Effica. Uh, that basically has two eight inch ports, one for an air inlet and one for an air outlet uh, to allow the heat exchange uh, to happen. Uh, they're extraordinarily efficient and they're about $2,000 a piece. So for $4,000, you can put one in the, the living room and one in the master bedroom and be done essentially with HVAC for, uh, for you know, the average size apartment, uh, which could be really beneficial. And you, you don't, as opposed to a PTAC, you don't need a grid uh, on the outside of the building. You need two fairly, um, you know, um, nonchalant ports on the outside. From an aesthetic standpoint, they're a little bit more um, aesthetically pleasing. Um, and this is the way most developers do uh, multifamily. Uh, they basically have a fan coil in, in the ceiling between the bedroom and the bathroom, and they run, um, they run uh, the uh, refrigerant lines up to the roof to the compressor. And that's generally how it's done. Uh, it's a very efficient way to do it if you have short duct runs. We know from experience with contractors, this is less expensive to do than a dual fuel solution. Uh, a couple of thousand dollars less. I have clients come to me and say, no, I, I got quoted too much, you know, too much for this thing. And that happens all the time. You want to find a contractor who does this all the time. We find the contractors who are used to doing a furnace and an air conditioning unit will charge more because they just don't know what they're doing. And they don't understand that buying all that hardware is not an advantage to the client. Um, but the people who do understand how to install heat pumps know that they can install them less expensively because that you don't have to install the other component, the furnace, right? It's all contained in the heat pump unit. Um, so um, we know it's less expensive. And then my hero, Nick, who's switching over all, all of his uh, dirty gas appliances to all electric, uh, has an experience with, uh, with, <laughs> with uh, the heat pump dryer. Nick, you wanna tell us about that? Yeah, when my gas one went on the fritz and I couldn't find a contractor to fix just the drum, I went and bought a Mealy. It's 120 volt. It plugs right in 15 amps, so standard circuit even. I, I believe other units are 240 volts, but this one wasn't. A reasonable size for our family of four and found a universal stacking kit to put it on top of a mismatched washer, which everyone told me I couldn't do. It's just worked great for two years. And 
we find they're gentler on clothes. The amount of lint left on the screen is much reduced from our gas dryer. And I think that's because they put a lower temperature air into the drum. And then rather than blowing that hot, moist air out of the building, which typical dryers do, it condenses the moisture out of the air and pumps it down the same drain the washer uses. So this is a fantastic technology for multifamily buildings that may have a hard time getting that terrible tin duct to wind around to an exterior wall to vent. So I think has really good application in multifamily buildings, even central laundry rooms, they have coin operated heat pump dryers. So I'm a big fan and I put a stacked Mealy unit uh, in the ADU behind me. It's it's awesome. And so Nick's my hero, and he's a, a more advanced than that. We we the the heat pump dryer was not prime time in 2012. It was not really ready, and uh, the technology has improved significantly since then. So uh, we're using a, an electric resistance dryer, which is still fine, uh, but this is much much better technology, much more efficient. And Nick was really thoughtful about this as well. Uh, the story that he told me that he didn't share with everybody is that the, the gas vent um, for his old dryer came out below his daughter's window. And the fact is that that could get that carbon dioxide could get sucked right back up into the house. And so being a thoughtful father that he is, that's another great reason to eliminate that in your house. Uh, so thank you, Nick. Hey, a question in chat before we leave HVAC. Please. Michael asked, for mini split systems, how do you heat the bathroom? And of course, ducted like you showed, no problem, but ductless mini splits are often used in multifamily. Yes, uh, and um, so each one of the rooms has a, you know, a cassette potentially. So depending on the size of the unit, um, you could put a cassette in there. Um, and in our um, class on the 26th, you'll see a number of different configurations. There are ceiling configurations that would be more appropriate for a bathroom, for example, uh, than having a cassette on the wall, uh, right? So if you can bury it up in, into the drywall, if you will, uh, that's a much better configuration. Um, and usually I, that airflow is going to get in the bathroom, especially yeah. if you're running an exhaust fan in the bathroom for mechanical ventilation anyway. Yeah. So Nick, you can tell me, I mean, by code, you probably can't do these, that this, what we did, but, but I did a calculation with one of the, um, one of the, the leading experts in, in this, in this field. And uh, we did the calculation to say, even if my heating system was 300% efficient, the fact is that the system isn't a hundred percent, you know, 300% efficient. And so what we ended up doing is a little strange, but we put a, a heat lamp in the bathroom. <laughs> I hate to say that. We put a heat lamp in the ba bathroom and that's 100% efficient and it's all electric. And so for those transitional months where the heating system isn't actually on, I can just hit the button and it has a timer on it. It goes off in 20 minutes and it's not a big deal. Yeah. It's 200, 200 watt bulb and it actually works perfectly for and the code for those provides for supplemental heat and bathrooms like that. There you go. So yeah. in in addition to that, obviously it has a vent, um, you know, a bathroom vent. And so the combination of those two things, it, one, it pulls in the the air from the rest of the house through the vent that's in the bathroom. And if I need a little spot heat, I just turn that on. So again, uh, great question uh, in that regard. Okay, so we're gonna keep on moving. Any other questions, Nick? No, we're good. We're good, fantastic. All right, so a friend of mine is putting in a giant pool at his house. His wife has a health condition and he wants to keep it at, at 85 degrees. And this is what we recommended. Um, you know, you could, you could buy the gas compa compatible gas model for about a thousand to two thousand dollars. And he chose to buy the four thousand dollar model. Why? Because in a year, he's going to save five thousand dollars. <laughs> right? It's not that hard, people. It's not that hard because it's going to be able to harvest the energy that's already in the air. There's a lot of heat in the air, in especially in you know, Southern California. Uh, so we want to use that, utilize that resource as much as possible. And these heat pump hot water units do that in terms of, um, you know, pool and spa usage. And they're very, very efficient to do so. He bought this exact model, as a matter of fact. 
And um, now we're going to move to more marketable buildings. All of this is nice in terms of the technology, but this is not how to sell this to clients, right? Clients don't want to hear all this technical detail. They want to know it's better, safer, et, et cetera, uh, and more efficient uh, and better for the economy and better for the environment. And that's what Nick's going to tell you about right next. Thanks, Robert. I think I'll, I'll share for this next section, yeah. Oh, yes, I need to stop, yeah. don't I? Yep, there Thanks. you go. Thanks. All right, that was awesome. But I'm not prepared. Don't look away, people, look away. You're gonna get dizzy. <laughs> All right. So we wanna, I, I think this is the most important section here because the reason to do this all electric thing, sure there's planet reasons and there's economic reasons, but I think if you're in the business of making multifamily buildings, they need to sell, they need to rent. And there's a really compelling value proposition here that hopefully we're building one step at a time for you uh, if you're not already doing that. And it starts with indoor air quality. Robert covered cooking first because that's been perceived as the biggest obstacle to all electric buildings. Um, he showed that that's one of perception and non-familiarity more than anything else. And by removing gas combustion from our buildings, both cooking, clothes drying, you know, the, the clothes dryer was right outside my daughter's room too. And we know gas systems in homes and buildings leak. Um, so that was part of the reason too. Um, we can offer greatly improved indoor air quality in our multifamily buildings. And that should have a compelling value proposition to a large segment of the population. They also should be economical to run, especially with the 2019 code requiring solar panels on all low rise multifamily buildings. And in 2022, that's gonna be extended to high rises. So the economics really work if you're gonna be putting solar panels on the roof, you might as well run more and more of your systems off the electricity they produce, right? And if you include EV charging, as we hope you will, uh, at the end of this presentation, that's a must have amenity increasingly in both market rate and affordable multifamily buildings. And if you don't do it now at the time of construction or major remodel, it's gonna be a lot more expensive to do it future and your building's gonna be stuck in the past till you do. And then for those segment of the population who are climate motivated, and that's a growing segment, uh, you've got a really strong, you've got a slam dunk. And for those who maybe are more about self-sufficiency, um, they're gonna find something to like in an all electric building, especially one paired with battery storage and a multifamily building developer thinking ahead, I think puts a battery in to serve the common areas of a multifamily building so that those tenants can shelter in, in some common place, have a place to charge their phones, uh, et cetera. So I think that's, that's a strong combination. And I wanna take you next to C.R. Harrow of Meritage, a hero of mine. They've They've always been on the cutting edge on energy efficiency. And he freely admits today, they made a mistake in the early days. They were trying to sell energy efficiency in lab coats with efficiency ratings and R values that, that don't speak to the emotional side of the home purchase, home selection process. So now in gold, he says, we tell them their homes will be more comfortable, save them money, children will be healthier, quality of life will improve, and that they're making a smart investment. So even Meritage, a leader in this space, their, their sales pitch has evolved. And I think ours needs to too. We need to sell our clients. Me as an energy consultant, I need to try to convince that architect developer to sell on health, future proofing, lower costs, climate satisfaction, those things we uh, have the advantage of if we build all electric. And here's a project that CR had a part in. SCE also had a, was a partner in this. It's in the flight path at John Wayne Airport in Irvine. These units were built affordably with standard solar on the roof, all electric, really low HERS scores, um, sold out during COVID. 
and they have induction cooking. Each has a heat pump dryer, a heat pump water heater in the garage, a ducted heat pump. And they did this several years ago, sold out no problem, very popular. And they paired it with the efficient building envelope Meritage always does. If you're in the affordable segment, and probably uh, a lot of what you guys at Partner Energy I see in the chat of are, then you know that you can charge higher rent if you can prove lower utility bills. But not every multifamily developer realizes this opportunity is out there. But in this example, it's about a hundred unit building, they were able to reduce monthly typical utility bills by over a hundred dollars. And that ended up generating $160,000 in added rent. And you document that using the QAC tool, all right? So there are returns to this if you know where to look. Because the solar requirement for new multifamily projects helps keep these all electric units affordable. Our modeling shows utility bills of between 20 and $40 a month in a 2019 code multifamily building, whether you do it mixed fuel or all electric. We put that in there to debunk the myth that gas is cheaper and recognize that gas systems require maintenance just like electric ones do in some cases, more, uh, more intensive maintenance like uh, tankless water heaters. And those heat pump water heaters, Robert showed you, if, that, if some small component of those fail, they're most likely gonna replace the whole unit with a 10 year warranty. Uh, that's better than you get with uh, gas tankless. I know that because I had to replace the uh, heat exchanger in my gas tankless already and, and got nothing from the manufacturer on it. Let's not forget too, the cost to set up gas meters is extreme, $2,000 to $3,000 a unit, we estimate for gas infrastructure and multifamily building. And you're gonna pay a monthly fee for the, for the service that you can completely eliminate by going all electric. All right, the fourth step. The garage is a place to park your cars, yes but it's also an opportunity for a forward thinking multifamily uh, owner to offer amenities that people want. And, and I'm here to tell you, EV charging is the number one amenity you can put in there. And building your building on top of a revenue producing gas station as Robert calls it, is a really exciting prospect too. In fact, I saw a guy in, in, out from Washington state who really opened my eyes on this uh, a few years ago at a conference. And it, he, he'd run all the numbers and showed the payback was there to put these things in now. And it's only up from here. We're gonna show you at the end today, cause we want you to stay tuned for the whole thing. SCE's charge ready incentive program that can cover the entire cost of installing these EV chargers in qualifying buildings. So make sure you're aware of that, charge ready. And by installing them today, you're future proofing for an all EV future. We know combustion vehicles are doomed in California, won't be sold here after 2035. And there's a lot of other amenities you can put in your garages like storage spaces especially in, in tight urban environments uh, and of course bike racks and such. So start on these garage layouts, give them some real thought. Uh, don't treat it as, a, as an automatic afterthought. Because we know at this point, this was novel a year ago when we, when we first built this presentation, but we know EVs are, are gaining steam. All the major automakers have, have made commitments to it. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of EVs needing to charge in our multifamily buildings. Here's the latest statistics on California plug-in vehicle sales up to 13% of sales last year. It's hockey sticking up. So our multifamily garages need to support this trend or your tenants are gonna look elsewhere. So demand is there now. Think about your low income building tenants who are, who are likely to take these EVs off lease um, with affordable uh, sales of used 
uh, EVs. So it's going to be everywhere in both segments of multifamily. And the SCE rebate program can allow you to do it at, at zero or very low cost. So there was a question in chat, and it looks like it's really moving up there. Question in chat about the economical payback on EV charging. I'm glad you asked because we wanted to include that in this presentation. We knew it was, it was a glaring omission not to. And so we worked with one of the uh, prominent EV installers in our area to build this financial model. There's more detail in a later slide, but he said, let's say you've got a hundred parking spots in this building. You install 10 EV chargers today. With the charge ready program, you can do that with money back to you if you also include a tax credit. But let's just say um, even at zero out of pocket, you're generating $10,000 in extra annual income by year three is the expectation on these. That means a quarter of a million dollar higher property value for that building. And that's how these assets are valued. And if you plan ahead for another 10 chargers in year seven or 10, now your annual income's more than double that and your property values up to half a million dollar delta. So it's a compelling addition to any multifamily building. I don't know why you would build one today without it. All right, Nick, let me switch over. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tend to the chat questions. All right, can you stop sharing? I did. Oh, you did, okay. Yeah. There we go. All right, yes, I, I love the fact that the participants are so astute. They're asking great questions and the, the other participants participants are answering the questions. <laughs> so it. it's, a, it's a nice community that we've built here. So it, it, Build It Green has built. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. <clears throat> All right. So now what we want to talk about is um, really how things start and sometimes start on the wrong foot, right? So what happens when a development happens? You guys are, we have developers in the audience and you guys understand or you work with developers and influence developers and you know what happens. Somebody finds a piece of dirt, right? That's the first step, you find a piece of dirt and then what, what do you do? You hire an architect or you find a friend architect and what's the question you ask them? You ask them how many units can fit on that piece of dirt, right? That's what happens and we see it every single day and it's all about the pro forma. And then the performer gets built and you lock that, that number of units in and off you go. Everything else is based on that number of units and on and on it goes. And we've seen this as a you know, potential opportunity. Let's put it that way, because you eventually get to the permit desk and the permit desk says, wait a minute, you can't do that. You need to put in a transformer, right? or a larger transformer or something. And then, you know, potentially you, you might lose a unit. Um, and there are reasons to lose a unit. For example, the opportunity to essentially get out of the hot water business and to have a closet for each unit that's dedicated to hot water could get you out of the hot water business as a developer, as somebody who owns these properties over time. Again, most of my, most of my clients are, are people who own these properties, you know, in perpetuity. And they, the maintenance costs for hot water is, are ridiculous because the tenant knows when it's centralized hot water that they don't need to care about, you know, how long the showers are or whatever. And we literally have a, a couple of tenants who take 24 hour showers uh, and there's nothing that they can do about it. Right. I mean, you guys know this happens. This is real. Um, I'm not making this up. The other thing that happens in these buildings with centralized hot water is that there's a continuous recirc loop that's running around the building continuously. And the people who do the metering for this understand that it can be as much as 100% of the energy load just to keep that loop of hot water continuously going around the building. So again, there's great reasons to consider taking rentable square footage 
off of the table if you're thinking about long-term costs of operations maintenance costs. And so that's what we want you to think about at this early stage. And so if you wanna dedicate a 30 by 30 closet to each one of your units or split them up, you know, uh, something like that, this is a different kind of opportunity. So you have to think early. You just can't go to the traditional architect and say, how many units will fit on this piece of dirt? You're gonna get the wrong answer. And so that's where you pull in somebody like myself or somebody like Nick and say, how do we think about this really as a revenue opportunity or cost saving opportunities from the very, very start of the process? And that's what we really focus on. And we have to think about things differently. We have to consider the orientation for PV. Again, if the roof is the engine of the building and you're building in a traditional way, we see it over and over again. You're disadvantaging yourself by not thinking about orientation and what's going on the roof. If you just do what they always do, plop the hot water tanks up there and so forth and so on, that's a disadvantage. So we want to start early on these, on these projects. Um, the SE Charge Ready Program is, a, as, as Nick mentioned, um, is a great opportunity. Um, and there's another, a number of other incentives. There's $3,100 for um, heat pump hot water heaters uh, that are available, $1,700 per bedroom for the build program. All of these incentives are available to you guys and you should take, take advantage of them uh, if you can. Uh, obviously there's some paperwork and some other you know, aggravating stuff that goes with it, but there are tax credits for EV charger uh, programs and, and so on. So there's a number of different things that really have to be baked into your, into your process. We see it all the time that it's not thought about properly. And uh, this is one of my clients on the lower right-hand side. Uh, I audited this building. It was a LEED certified building. And the, uh, I don't know if you can see it here, on the lower right hand side, you can see a compass, right? And the compass tells you the story uh, because the solar array is facing southeast. It's not actually optimized for Southern California. Uh, what happens in June, right? You have something called June gloom. And so until midday, there's no sun effectively. And so, you know, there's some solar gain, but you're missing the biggest part of the day. And what did they do here? If you guys can see, they put the HVAC units right in the, opt Southwest is actually optimal in terms of orientation for solar. And they put the HVAC units, you know, in both of the optimal areas for solar, they put HVAC units, right? And they could have put those HVAC units on this part of the building, but they didn't, right? They missed that opportunity. What would it take to change that back out? it's not going to happen, right? Everybody knows that the PL, p l on this building is an individual thing. And so nobody's going to spend the money to move that stuff around. So you've locked that problem in for what, the next 80 years or something like that is the, the, you know, the length of the building. And so that's why you have to start early. Uh, you want to think about these things differently. You want to help your clients set performance targets, um, really thinking about the heating and cooling demand in KPTUs per square foot per year, really have a number in mind. And really think about whole building air tightness because insulation works when these buildings are tight. Uh, there's some misperception that buildings need to breathe or something, only, you know, only, only need to breathe through the areas that they need to breathe through. The other areas, you're just reducing the insul insulating quality of the building by having it breathe through the walls. So, it, you know, this, there's a misperception about these things. And then you want to think about um, very clear owner's project. This is what I help my clients do, create clear owner's project requirements documents so that when the architect and the contractor come into the project, they know what they're, they're doing. They know what the objectives are, are for the building. So it makes it easier for them to design around these objectives. Um, and then basis of design documents get to very specific. You know, what should the solar be doing? What should those HVAC systems uh, be doing specifically for this particular building that they're doing? And uh, to have those documents in place before hiring all the rest of the contractors is, is what we do and what we recommend. Um, last is to think about the transformer differently. Uh, we know that transformers have been traditionally oversized. And um, I have a couple of uh, friends of mine who can tell the vintage of the person developing the electrical plan. Th that is, they can tell how old they are by how they calculate things. Um, and oftentimes they're over calculating, thinking that they're using, I don't know, 100 watt bulbs when they only need seven. 
you know, that kind of thing. And so as a result of that, that all leads to very oversized transformers. And oversizing transformer is a problem um, that's not easily rectified. That is, um, it's very expensive to get DWP and Southern California Edison to install those things for you. And so if we can minimize them and really think about the loads and work with your MP MEP early in the process to eliminate you know, unnecessary uh, calculation um, there. And um, our friends at Redwood Energy also have a watt diet calculator. And there's a little link uh, that you'll be able to hit um, in the PDF that'll take you for single family. They're developing one for multifamily, but that can help you get to that place where you just don't have to oversize the transformers because we, we understand it has been a problem. Um, this is an example of an all electric affordable 100, you know, 100 unit building in Ontario that was done correctly. Uh, they left plenty of space for the solar on the roof. They optimized that roof by doing a couple of key things. They attach the heat pumps to the parapet wall, right? So you don't have to actually use roof area, which is, you know, it's not brain surgery. We don't, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of thought to say, hey, that roof area is actually something we could harvest energy from. So why would we want to put our HVAC systems in there? So the key to it all is in this chart. And this is a, a fairly known chart, an old chart, um, and, and, the graphic basically depicts a couple of important things. One is um, the control that you have over the project, and that's the number one blue line. And you can see the control you have over the project declines significantly and fast as the red line increases. And the red line is basically the amount of money you spend. Okay, so it's ironic that the amount of money you spend leads to an inverse correlation with the amount of control you have over the project, but that's what we find. And at that intersection point is generally where the design is done. And uh, the design process is done in that space where you've already lost a ton of control over the project. So how do you gain the control back? By designing these things in early and setting expectations early in the process before you spend a ton of money. Uh, and it's not hard to do, it's just not often done. And so we, we end up seeing problems in the mix, which we'll talk about later in the process. But essentially, the way one of the ways to uh, avoid those problems is to bring in the energy modeler early. Basically, do a good energy model right when you have schematic design uh, done. And you'll be able to get through massing and daylighting um, and really understand how the building is working at a very, very early stage and be able to make the changes before a ton of time, energy and money has been plowed into it. You'll be able to build a compliance model to say that we can make it through Title 24 much easier if you do a couple of swap out things that are, again, really inexpensive to do early in the process, but very expensive to do later in the process. And you can do what if scenarios. You know, If we do something over here, then we might be able to get those seven foot sliders that we were looking for over there on the west side of the building, right? That's Those are the kinds of trade-offs that you're able to do early in the process, but they become very expensive after you've done the structural and after you've done all these things, um, they become much more problematic. And so Nick, again, one of the most ener uh, expert energy modelers in the state is gonna walk us through something that was startling. And we did this piece of work just for this program. And Nick's gonna explain yeah. how it makes energy efficiency um, Title 24 calculations and uh, compliance much easier with all electric than it would otherwise with the dual fuel building. Take it away, Nick. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if, if the other experts online today, actually, why don't you keep driving because you're about to oh. take back over. Um, sure. See this too. As I said before, it's as easy or easier to meet Title 24 with electric systems. That, that's a general statement. Um, but boy, we were surprised when we took this 36 unit low rise multifamily building, we put it in climate zone eight, one of my least favorite climate zones to work in, by the way, very difficult uh, to compensate for any deviation from prescriptive standard in this climate zone. And, and Nick, for the folks who don't know, what is climate zone eight? That's Irvine, yeah, Southern LA suburbs and, and down through Orange County. And why do you find it difficult? That is 
hard to explain. You know, the energy modeling software has its peculiarities because each climate zone has different weather files. And so any deviation on your walls and roofs and such has a different impact in different climate zones. And the same is true of mechanical systems. But what we found here was we started with a mixed fuel baseline and we measured the impact of high performance walls and triple pane windows and HRVs and a high efficiency gas tanklets and a high efficiency gas furnace split system. And then we switched the building to all electric and we saw the bar just balloon to three EDR points, which on a target of about 50 is, you know, over 6% solid. And then when we went to a best in class heat pump, the variable capacity heat pump credit, which is readily obtainable with ductless mini split equipment, it went up to almost five EDR points, really outclassing the upgrades possible with gas systems. Uh, so this was an extreme example maybe, but boy, compelling. And, and as to Kyle's point in the chat, we're gonna be asked, required in the new code starting next year to build gas systems that are readily retrofitable to their all electric replacements in the future. That's gonna drive up the cost of those gas systems. Um, so not only are there compliance benefits available as shown in this chart, but the economics of, of electric systems are just gonna get better in the new code. And this has currency. This type of compliance impact can allow you to add additional glazing like a six foot sliding glass door to each unit or reduce the size of the solar system, um, which saves you money. Next slide, Robert. So the heat pump is the, is the key to that, the variable capacity heat pump especially, but heat pump water heaters perform about as well as gas tankless units in our models too, if not slightly better. REACH codes in many of your uh, cities you work in are already either requiring all electric like Berkeley does or encouraging it like Santa Monica does. And the 2022 code is just gonna make this comparison more attractive to electric. The Cal Green code already requires EV capable garages. We're gonna make the argument in just a minute to go to EV installed. So by planning ahead, in Robert's fifth step section, it can ease compliance with Title 24 later. All right, Nick, that's fantastic. And, and as you mentioned, for, for a developer in the 2022 code to have to dual plumb everything just doesn't make any sense. So why, you know, why would you put gas in if you already have to already wire for electric? Um, so in my mind, that's a game changer. Uh, right there. All right, so we're going to uh, work through a couple of common missteps uh, that I've seen, and I just wanted to share some uh, thousands of photographs from the seven years of auditing that I've done. Uh, I just wanted to share a couple of with with the group today. You know, just so they're not hard. Uh, it's just the stuff that I see. You know, again, I just scratch my head. Like, how did this happen? Um, so somebody that built a development and put on the south side. Thank goodness, it's on the south side, which I don't often, you know, sometimes I, I see it on the north side, uh, but they put solar panels on the south side of the building, which is a good thing, right? Um, but then they planted a tree and the tree is shading um, the array. And this particular array has an inverter that doesn't have what is called an optimizer. And the optimizer allows the current to go around the shaded panel and because it doesn't have one, the current stops and it basically disables the array. And so this tree has disabled the array. And so you're not actually producing energy uh, from all this very, very expensive installation. Um, you have to understand what you're doing um, piece by piece and understand how that works. So somebody also, uh, so I, want, I walk up to the inverter and the inverter has an error code on it. And so I say to the maintenance guy, how long has it had this inverter error? And he said, I have no idea. So I went back and I looked at the records. This building has not been, the, the solar array has not been operating for the last five months. 
So they've just lost, you know, a huge chunk of their ROI. And I said, so who gets the email from, so this inverter sends an email to somebody and he says, I have no idea, right? So we have to understand that these things need some level of maintenance. It's not difficult, but somebody received an email and ignored it. And, you know, and as a result of that, the return on investment just goes away. And so if you can't have an organization, it's a small thing, but if you can't have an organization that can take an email and do something about it, then you want to think about leasing. I'm not a big proponent of leasing because it's not economically the most efficient way to do things. But if that's the case, your organization just can't manage that, lease the, the panels. This way somebody else is responsible and they'll get the email that the panels are down and they need to be serviced and, and so forth. And, and so just think, creatively about not only the purchase of these things, but the maintenance of these things. Um, if you guys just take a second and to look what, how, I'll, I'll give you a couple of stats here. This is December 20th, December 20th at about two o'clock in the afternoon. So two, two o'clock in the afternoon is high time when you should be generating a lot of energy, right? In your systems. And so what's happening here? What's happening here is you've got a parapet wall that's actually shading the first panel. The first panel is actually shading the second panel. The second and first panel are shading the PV panels. So these are water panels, right? Hot water panels. And all of this equipment over the course of the day shades the PV panels. So again, you're, this is a lead, get this, lead platinum building that will never work well in its lifetime. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are easily avoidable if you think about them early, right? Now it's very difficult to, and I have a, you know, sort of, you know, a couple of sayings, right? Think of this as the engine of the building. You've decimated the engine of the building, number one. And number two, it's, it's simple. Put the tall stuff in the back, you know, put it on the north side of the building. It's not that hard, but put the tall stuff in the back and don't block the solar access. That's, it's not that hard. They did a couple of things, right? They, they did mount the, you know, the HVAC compressors on the parapet wall. Um, but the rest of this stuff is, you know, difficult. Um, there are creative and beautiful things to be doing. Uh, one is to access the roof area that's over top of the common area. So you can, by, by code, as long as it's non-structural, put stuff over the sidewalk. That's possible to do uh, by code. You can do that. So you can actually expand your footprint in a beautiful and creative way. And this building um, by Onion Flats does something really interesting. And they, they put metering devices and LEDs in each one of the windows that says, if you're using more energy than you should be at this particular time of the day, there's going to be a red light. If you're using less than, than what be, would be normal, there's going to be a green light. And then they randomize the windows so it doesn't point to the person who's actually, you know, the perpetrator. But you can get a general profile of how the building's working, and it's a beautiful display at the same time. So these are the kinds of creative things that can create a consciousness of your tenants of how they're using energy. At the same time, do something that's artful and beautiful. And there are lots of other examples of great buildings, and we don't have the time to go into the intimate details, but here's City Ventures built um, a, a development in Covina, 68 units, um, prices from 470 to 620, which is very much in line in that area. And they saved a lot of energy and they built more efficient, better buildings with these kinds of components, Energy Star, you know, heat pump, hot water heaters, and so forth and so on. And th they're better buildings that are more efficient. And especially in Southern California, they eliminate a lot of the chance of the risk of fire and explosion by getting the gas out of the building. All right, so we are at our... 12, 15 point, and we're going to move into EV charging. Nick, take it away. Yeah, can you stop the share? I will. Just did. Awesome. And Robert, while I, while I switch here, there was a question in the chat about transformer sizes. Um, you made a comment that transformers are often oversized. Can you clarify that? Yes. Um, so what we're finding is that as a result of putting all of this equipment into the buildings, you need a larger transformer, uh, which is oftentimes true. Uh, but what we're finding is that the, the, the specifications for all the loads is overdone. And so 
the the MEPs are not careful with their uh, specifications, and as a result of that, they trans they they then um, sort of they build in too much of a safety margin, and then they push the transformer size up one or two sizes more than is easily obtainable. Uh, from the utility. And as a result of that, it, it causes a de delay. And so, for example, with um, DWP, they, they said, we won't be able to get that transformer for another six months. Um, so that's the kind of delay that, you know, if you're not careful and you're not starting early in the process, you're going to end up with a delay in your construction cycle if you're not careful. Um, and, it, and the smaller transformers are generally faster um, you know, the turnaround time is generally faster. So if you can minimize the size by being very careful with the specifications uh, in, in the loads, then you, you, you will advantage your proce process and your ability to get those transformers faster, in my wow. experience. Good stuff. Love your real world experience, Robert. All right, with our last conclusion, we're gonna show you where the money is for EV charging. Um, Cal Green, as you know, reproduced down there at the bottom of the slide, requires 10% of multifamily parking spots to be EV capable. It means you have the cost of the circuit and the conduit to the place where your EV charger is going to be, but you just haven't finished off the process. So the SCE rebate program, Charge Ready, is designed to take you from that minimum to full installation today. Because I ask you, what are these painted parking spots really doing for you and your building? Not much. They might have been progressive 10 years ago, but now they're just um, window dressing. And what's the cost for you now during the major remodel or new multifamily building construction process to install all this as compared to cutting the concrete and running conduit later? Much, much higher. So encourage you to step up to full installation. It'll help you, as we said before, attract tenants, probably well-to-do tenants who can pay their rent, um, generate charging revenue, where before it was you know, not a revenue producing space in your building. And we're at a pretty mature state of EV evolution when typically there's not incentive money available anymore. But in this case, there is, so it's a nice opportunity to take advantage of it if you can. Some places require going from the minimum EV capable configuration to EV ready, where you've actually got the circuit breaker all the way installed in the panel. Um, that's a good next step. But going all the way to EV installed means you can start the flow of electricity and revenue in this building. So best practice, according to our EV consultant, designed for at least 10% of ports to be installed now, expandable to 20% of ports in the near future. And thinking beyond that is probably a good idea too. So it means, it means transformers, it means conduit and wiring, um, larger electrical supplies. And it'd be interesting to start considering bi-directional charging too. There's a day in the not too distant future where these vehicles parked in our multifamily garage or single family for that purpose are going to be help, going to help us get through peak period without paying high electricity charges. So what that means is probably Wi-Fi enabled, internet enabled control systems in your garages. So make sure they're capable of that. Some of these smart charging systems on the market now do a real service for the building owner as well. Balancing load between multiple charging stations, ramping down the total um, electricity usage during peaking, peak periods to control your demand charges, shifting power from a car that's almost full to one that needs it more, um, actively managing time of use rates and electricity spend. They also can coordinate payments from your residents and reports that SCE is going to ask you for um, to verify participation in their rebate program. Also coordinates moving vehicles when tenants have to rotate them through chargers because there aren't enough. 
So this program is, it's just uh, over six months old. It's $400 million. So there's plenty of life left in it. They're still accepting reservations and they're targeting 30 to 40,000 charging points in SCE territory alone with this. And there's three programs. Let's start with the new construction multifamily program since that's what we're talking about today. It'll cover up to 100% of the cost of the charger and the electrical infrastructure, up to $3,500 a port. And these EV chargers are running about $2,000 each. So there's quite a bit of room there for electrical infrastructure. Could even use it to provide for future EV charger expansion. And they are targeting disadvantaged communities as many California Energy Commission projects are. So they're asking you, trying to create incentives for multifamily developers to exceed minimum Cal Green and go all the way to installed. This section of the program is expected to, to fund 15,000 ports, half of those in disadvantaged communities. There are two other program sectors I wanna make sure you're aware of in case it fits into some of your practices. Um, one is for existing non-residential and multifamily properties. This is the first column. And, and in this, they'll, they'll provide a similar benefit, cover the infrastructure out to the charging station and a rebate to offset the installation of that charging station. They're targeting about 20,000 ports with that segment. So if you have existing multifamily buildings, you may be able to qualify for incentives. If you're an existing multifamily building and you're located in a disadvantaged community, you can take advantage of the second column, the turnkey installation, where SCE will do handle the whole thing, soup to nuts, come out, install the chargers, operate them, maintain them for you. So you can provide that amenity at your building without any management required. They have a useful approved charging station um, listing here to the question earlier in the chat, wondering about different models, this might be a really good place for you to start. And it works like a lot of the other um, California clean energy rebate programs typically have where you file a funding request and once approved, uh, that should be within about a month. You have three years to design or and build the project and then file your incentive request, at which time they'll review the documents, come out and verify the installation was done, issue your rebate, and then you just have some ongoing compliance verification responsibilities, including monthly monitoring uh, and reporting. You need to be in a time of use rate plan. Uh, you need to be in a demand response enabled time of use rate plan you need to pledge to keep the equipment operational 10 years, report the prices you charge. And there are three EV multifamily rate plans currently in SCE territory with rates that vary a lot depending on time of use, but they've pledged to have no demand charges for these SCE um, time of use EV rates till 2024 and even then phase them in over five years. They really don't, they really want to encourage these early adopters to take the incentive money, put the ports in and give them runway to figure out how to make them uh, a strong revenue producer, how to manage those demand charges. You can own or lease and participate in this program, but owning gives you full revenue potential and full control, leasing does not. So certainly seems to be superior option to own. This is the financial model we built for EV charging. And if anyone wants to reach out to me at the end for more details on this, I'm happy to share it. But the initial outlay after the rebate was just barely uh, there. And with the tax credit brought down the out of pocket to negative, we expect 75,000 kilowatt hours from 10 charging stations by year three, plus a small fee to participate in the program. Um, so that's how we get to $10,000 in expected incremental income. 
and the quarter million dollars in incremental property value. And then at year seven or 10, you install another 10 and, and more than double those numbers. Parking lots need to be carefully laid out. There's ADA requirements to ensure that the, there's a van spot for um, accessibility that's EV chargeable first. Then you can go ahead and install the other spots. But in this layout, about 100 parking spots, we were able to install eight EV chargers to service 15 charging spots. Pretty, uh, pretty solid. And if you installed them in the center bay of parking spots, you probably could have reached even more. Here's a layout for a smaller five EV charger setup and an even smaller still two EV spot layout. So to summarize, and we did it, Robert, in the time allotted, <laughs> We showed you seven steps to doing this. We showed you the why, the how, hopefully it was a bit of a surface treatment. Encourage you to uh, attend our April class if you want more detail on any of this, but uh, hopefully we conveyed to you the compelling value proposition that this stuff is proven and ready to roll for your projects. And hopefully we communicated the case for including EV charging in these projects, these multifamily buildings. We included a ton of resources that we've found helpful over the years um, that will come and you'll be able to click on those in your PDF and sincerely hope that we communicated and answered these three questions, how electrification can save time and money on your projects, what the best practices are, for making sure these projects go smoothly, especially the first time, and have given you some thought provoking material to think about what is keeping you from doing this today. There's our contact information. We'd love to hear stories from the field. We, even if it's uh, questioning some of our claims and, and uh, you know, we wanna be in touch with you in an ongoing basis and can't thank Build It Green enough for getting, boy, 30 people here today. Chloe, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. That was thanks. awesome. Um, thank you, guys. Really appreciate you putting on such a uh, educational presentation. I hope, thank everyone else that uh, showed up to this session today. Um, we have been recording it, so we'll be posting it shortly on our YouTube. So um, you can rewatch any of the session or share it with others. Um, and again, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Robert. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to everybody on the, the chat. What a great group of people just uh, posing great questions and answering them as well. <laughs> so very impressive. Uh, it's fantastic. I love this the community. This was a sharp group. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Thanks, everybody. And, and please feel, feel free to reach out. Uh, again, there's a thousand things that we couldn't and didn't have the time to cover today. And this was a, you know, sort of a condensed version of the regular and then um, you know, there's so many more things we can't even fit into the four hour class because Nick and I live it every day. Um, and so if you have questions or concerns or anything else we can help you with, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, guys. See you later. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.